I don't know why we take lightly this marriage thing. God gave us marriage. People think that I'm idolatrous. I've been told this a lot. But when you understand the word of God in the way that you, you see in the Bible, you would understand that marriage is one of the greatest analogies to your relationship with the Lord. There are certain things in this world that cannot be described by words alone. There are certain concepts and ideas of all creation that words are insufficient. Therefore, God created things so that we can have what words fail to describe. And I believe truly there is no greater analogy to the love of God to his creation than that of the love between a husband and a wife. None whatsoever. And through me loving my wife, and her loving me, not only emotionally and intelligently, uh, financially, or in spending time together, but intimately, physically, that sexual union serves a specific purpose. And I know we don't like to talk about it because it's weird in the church, but sex has a, a very vital role in us understanding God's relationship to the creation. This ain't no weird type of comparison. Don't get it twisted of the divine and the... I'm not talking about no Genesis chapter 6 where angels get in with women. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about that the physical act, act of consummation, the coming together and being one, becoming one, is literally called by Paul in Ephesians chapter 1 a mystery. It is a mystery of creation, of how two can become one. And here's what's interesting. A wedding, a marriage is not official until the final consummation. Until your body is united with the body of your spouse and that sexual, intimate, beautiful act is performed, enjoyed, to the glory of God, you have no marriage. And that is biblical. So much so that, I know it sounds weird culturally because we're not in that culture anymore. But on the night of the wedding, it was common practice either for the priest or the fathers to be outside of the tent waiting for the act to complete so that the blanket or the bed sheet may be brought out with blood on it. Because it is the blood of the virgin that consummates and protects the marriage. Is it, doesn't that sound familiar? It was by the blood of Jesus that we were sanctified and set apart. And isn't it crazy that when two virgins come together that what ends up happening and naturally. I know this is a weird conversation but it doesn't feel weird to me because this is the beauty of God's word. And we're going to get into the word. When two virgins come together, it's beautiful that the proof and, 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 and the evidence that the, the marriage is now consecrated and holy unto God is that the woman releases blood. And it's evidence of her virginity. And it's that virginity between both of them that now this holiness is protected of this marriage. Her virginity and his virginity. Boom, is the protection that God sets as a hedge around them. Now, this is not to say we, we, obviously we live in a different time. We live in a time where some people didn't come to know Christ and we all in different situations. I'm talking about the ideal and the way that God designed it to be. I'm not talking about unique situations where people find themselves not in that, not able to have been experienced that. So this is the beauty of consummating, right, of, of, of coming together. And what's so beautiful about that is that the euphoric experience, that, that experience that you have with your, with your spouse and you reach that place of, you know, ultimate euphoria, right? There's no other, there's nothing else in this world that comes close to that type of experience. And what can we learn from that spiritual? Sex is a spiritual, it's, it's a spiritual experience. That's why it's such a great offense to God that we experience that spiritual experience outside of the context of marriage. It's a grave, a grave offense to God because that he has set 
as one of the greatest experiences to compare and learn of God's purest form of love. It's an analogy. It's a metaphor to these things. And the final thing that I'll say on this, not to belabor the point, unless you guys have any more questions in regards to this, we'll go to the next question. Going a little bit in a different direction so that you can understand the Bible and God and his creation to a deeper degree. There are two individuals who are responsible for what we understand as modern fantasy of the genre, right? I'm talking about books and movies, right? And that is C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien. C.S. Lewis with the Chronicles of Narnia and uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, who are considered the fathers of modern fantasy. And they are literally the standard by which all these other people have been influenced in regard to fantasy. Both Christian men, J.R.R. Tolkien, a devout Catholic, and C.S. Lewis, a devout, a devout Christian uh, pr Protestant man. They were close friends. And what both of these men have contributed to the world is this genre of fantasy. And oftentimes when people would t talk to them, they would ask them, what is the purpose of writing fantasy and this genre of myth? And what I love, I don't remember if it was C.S. Lewis or J.R.R. Tolkien, who again, they, they've inspired things like Harry Potter and Star Wars and Game of Thrones and all these other like monumental things that are culturally relevant to our society. When they were asked, what is the purpose of myth? When we hear the word myth, we think myth means something that is not true. Well, these two authors, they said that's not what myth means. At least in the fantastical sentiment, what myth means is to connect the physical with the spiritual in a way that cannot be communicated by words or things that we understood or understand in our present existence. Therefore, we have created these worlds of fantasy to close the gap of that which we cannot understand. Like, like it's just like oh my god if you understand the depth of what they are talking about and when they're saying that the the world of narnia the world of uh somebody tell me what's the world of lord of the rings i can't i, I can't remember right now that these worlds they are created for the purpose of promoting the gospel and helping you understand something that cannot be understood simply through words. Sometimes imagery is more potent. Sometimes a poem, art, a dance, a song, there are things that are so uh, more, much more important than just words alone. And that's the beauty of when you look at the world, wor world in comparison to the Bible and the things that are like weird and awkward in the Bible, there you go and you understand it because God is infinite. God is greater, multidimensional, so much greater than we can understand that if he was to show us his glory, we will be destroyed for all eternity. That he's trying to communicate things to us of which we simply cannot understand and so great was his demonstration that he demonstrated it onto the cross and death on the cross and victory over the grave how how incredible is that instagram please forgive me oh the the land of middle earth thank you for that so isn't that incredible i'm gonna go a little bit further on the sex thing and not so much in this on the sexual thing but I want to bring back holiness and sanctity to this act because the church has failed us completely in speaking about sex and why we should wait for marriage to have sex. They have failed us absolutely, totally, and utterly. I'm not going to talk to you about sex, but I'm going to let the world talk to you about sex. So then everything that I understand about sex came from the world. You rather me learn about sex from the world than you talk about it in church because you uncomfortable. You uncomfortable to talk about sex. So you don't want me to learn about sex. So you failing all of us singles. 
So we got to go and figure it out on our own. And most are, are trying to experiment and losing the preciousness that is their sanctity that is attached to their virginity. That doesn't mean that if you've lost your virginity that you are no longer holy. God restores. But the person who is a virgin, there's a reason why in the book of Revelation, it talks about the group of men who will be set apart for God because they held to their virginity. There is a depth and we need to put importance. Not everything is equal, guys. Not everything is equal. We just got to be real with it and not be afraid to hurt feelings. Again, if you, if you came outside of the context of that, God will restore you. But we cannot put it on the same level of people who have suffered and sacrificed and held on to their purity for the sake of God. Now, there's a difference, beloved, between virginity and holiness. There is a difference between virginity and purity. There's a lot of virgins out here that ain't pure at all. At one point on TikTok, it was cool within the Christian community to put the V-card on display and brag about your virginity. Beloved, you're a virgin, but you ain't pure. There's a difference between virginity and purity. And the one who is a virgin and impure, you are impure, beloved. But the one who's not a virgin and is protecting their purity at all costs, beloved, you have been considered pure. It's like the, the, the 18th chapter of Ezekiel. So the righteous man who repents from his righteousness, all his righteousness will be considered wickedness and his righteousness will be forgotten. But to the wicked who repent from their wickedness, their wickedness will be forgotten and they will be considered righteous before the Lord. So what am I trying to say? If there's any youngins watching or anybody watching, whether you're virgin or not, protect your purity and understand that God designed sex for a specific purpose within a specific context to communicate something that goes far beyond words. But that communication can only be had between a man and a woman and even further between a husband and a wife. Why do you think it's why do you think that virgins who hold themselves and dedicate themselves to God and are called to singleness, their reward is going to be a lot greater in heaven because they sacrificed one of the greatest desires to the human body that God created us with. So much so that Paul compares sexual intimacy to even eating. Is that necessary? So we need to bring back, like, I don't know if I want to say anticipation or preserve the beauty that is sexual intimacy. We live in a sexually saturated society, right? We, we live under that. It's so saturated that it's like we're overwhelmed by everything we see. So everything starts with the man. Fellas, we got the responsibility. We need to leave society. Society is our responsibility. We are the ones responsible for what's happening in the world. So is you responsible, me responsible. I need to guard my eyes because what enters the eyes lights the whole body. Jesus said, and if the eyes and the soul was filled with darkness, how dark is that darkness? So you got to protect yourself with what you're watching. I'm going to be real with you. I stop, I stop scrolling on TikTok. I don't, I don't scroll on TikTok no more. And it's so unfortunate because I used to love TikTok so much. That's why I learned about these like snacks. <laughs> I'll be watching everybody selling their little Mexican snacks and stuff. I got to show y'all. Like they, they be selling it, right? I had to stop using TikTok because TikTok started to turn into old school Twitter. You just be scrolling and all of a sudden like some something so inappropriate pops up. And it's like, yo, I got to pre preserve my sanctity. I got to preserve my my holiness i gotta preserve my myself my purity i can't just be giving myself up to stuff like that and and, and whatever else i desire to see on there is not worth it so i i stop i stopped going on tiktok man and, and instagram is getting to that point to me not for that reason because instagram is actually a lot better i use the parental controls and I limit like any type of explicit things 